From 1939 to 1946, 14 films came out starring Basil Rathbone as the most famous, the most popular, the most iconic detective of all time, Sherlock Holmes. And today you're here asking, is it possible for someone to rank all 14 of these movies from the worst to the best? And to that I would say, actually, it's elementary, my dear viewers. Elementary. <laughs> Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Cobwebs channel. My name is Daniel. And yes, today we're going to be ranking all 14 films starring Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. Over the past month, I checked out all 14 of these movies on this Blu-ray collection, which came out quite a few years ago, but it's still readily available. And I highly recommend it. I had a lot of fun going through these movies, the ups and downs of them, as I'm going to tell you about today. The first two films were made by Fox and they were period piece films taking place in Victorian England as the original Sir Arthur Conan Doyle stories did. And after that, Universal actually bought the rights to the series and brought them to present day, which in this case was the 1940s, for the remainder of the series. Now, this, of course, is not the only time that Sherlock Holmes would be brought to present day. The BBC series with Benedict Cumberbatch did that. There was also an American series called Elementary that did that as well. And it was a very interesting transition between those two different phases of the series. Now, a lot of these films I actually saw when I was a kid, so the experience of re-watching all of them to prepare for this video was really fun and nostalgic. Basil Rathbone has always been my Sherlock Holmes, my favorite version of the character. I think he's so incredible. He just has that really arrogant edge that I think Sherlock Holmes should have while still maintaining this great moral center and just feeling like he's just this great moral leading man that you just love to follow. Basil Rathbone played a lot of villains throughout his career, like in The Adventures of Robin Hood and kind of Son of Frankenstein as well, you might say, but uh, as a hero, but a hero with just enough edge right there, I think he's so phenomenal. He's got like the perfect look for the character. Absolutely amazing. And I really like Nigel Bruce as Watson as well. I know a lot of people have problems with the fact that they really lean into making him comedy relief, a little bit too much of a buffoon. At, there are times in the series where I do agree with that, but for the most part, I find him extremely likable and a, a great counterpoint to Holmes. While Holmes is incredibly serious and all business most of the time, Watson just makes you feel right at home in these movies and I just find him such a joy to watch so overall I do also love Nigel Bruce and I think they're such a great pair with great chemistry in these movies but with all that said let's go ahead and jump right into the ranking with number 14 which is actually the first film that Universal made when they took over the series the third film overall and that is Sherlock Holmes and the Voice of Terror England at the start of World War II is dealing with mysterious wire broadcasts that are apparently from Nazi Germany. They warn of attacks of terror in England just before they actually take place. Baffled, the defense committee calls in Sherlock Holmes. So after watching the first two Victorian period piece films that had great atmosphere, I went to this third film and was just crushed at the beginning of it, where it became very clear this was going to be a war movie. It opens up with a boardroom of government officials and army people all talking about World War II and Nazi Germany, blah, blah, blah. And I was just crushed, honestly. I was just not into it at all. When it's, it's not at all what I want from Sherlock Holmes. From Sherlock Holmes, like, I want a mystery. I want murder. This is none of those things. It's not a mystery. It is a spy thriller about defeating Nazi Germany. It's straight up a World War II propaganda movie that they just drop Sherlock Holmes in kind of inexplicably. Now, I know there was a lot of World War II propaganda movies in this time. Totally get that. I understand the history behind it and all that, but it's not what I want from Sherlock Holmes. So this was by far my least favorite of the movies. The only one like that I really don't like. I found it very boring very uninteresting. Like I said, there isn't a mystery here. Now, you do have Evelyn Anchors in this, who I love from The Wolfman and a lot of other 1940s films, using a thick Cockney accent, which is weird and, and doesn't fit her, but, you know, that's okay. And the film just has no atmosphere to it, and I just so miss the period piece atmosphere of the first two. I think later on, Universal figured out how to make these modern day, but still feel very classic Sherlock Holmes. But in this film, 
They just did not have it yet. Jumping way ahead in the series, my number 13 is actually one of the last films, and that is Terror by Night. Holmes and Watson board a passenger train bound from London to Edinburgh to guard the star of Rhodesia, an enormous diamond worth a fortune belonging to an elderly woman of wealth. But within the first hour of the trip, the woman's son is murdered and the diamond stolen, and any of the passengers in the car could be the killer and thief. This film's plot is not directly based on any of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's stories, but does take elements of a few. Funny thing is, the film that was made just before this, Pursuit of Algiers, which will come up later on this list, is actually very similar in plot, so I kind of felt like I was watching the same movie again, uh, but this is definitely the more inferior version. It does feel, as the series goes on, that Basil Rathbone, who, as much as I love him as Sherlock Holmes, starts to get a little bit bored, and this, I think, is the worst example of that, where he just feels feels a little disengaged, a little uninterested. There's a collection of kind of super villains in this series, and this one introduces a new one who's apparently Moriarty's henchman, who is Colonel Sebastian Moran, and the actor that they get to play him is eh, so the a villain doesn't make a huge impression in this as much as Sherlock Holmes tries to talk him up and tell us how brilliant he is. Now, I will say this movie has maybe the funniest scene in the entire series, which is where Watson takes it upon himself to interrogate somebody on the train, goes terribly wrong, and ends up turning on him where the other guy starts interrogating Watson, and it's so funny. And because a perfect stranger to me got himself murdered, you come to question me. Well, we've got to question everybody. Are you a policeman? No. Then by what right do you force your way into my compartment? Well, I... Uh... What are you doing on this train? I know some people don't like how goofy Watson is in this series, but sometimes he's just so funny and just adds a great levity to these, and I think he definitely does in this one. Now, while these are very male-dominated movies, pretty much all of them have a beautiful female lead somewhere in there, and the one for this film is Renee Godfrey, who is a, an actress from New York, and she gives possibly the worst British accent I have ever heard in my entire life that someone had to leave London. Foreign agents were watching the train. Foreign agents. All right. Maybe I didn't believe that foreign agent story. But the mystery in this one is actually very short-lived, and the ending is extremely abrupt, and the movie's just eh. At number 12, we have got The Woman in Green. Sherlock Holmes investigates when young women around London turned up murdered, each with a finger severed. Scotland Yard suspects a madman, but Holmes believes the killing are part of an ingenious, diabolical plot. This film follows an original plot, but does take elements from a couple of classic Sherlock Holmes stories. The Final Problem and the Adventures of the Empty House. I got kind of excited at the very beginning of this movie because with all these murders going on, they're starting to uh, name drop Jack the Ripper. And I'm kind of fascinated by Jack the Ripper, so I thought this might actually be a Sherlock Holmes Jack the Ripper crossover, as some films made much later did end up being. But that's not what this movie ends up being. The movie ends up feeling very low energy at the start and just never quite picks it up in the way that I wanted it to. Now, it does start out with one interesting thing of a guy waking up having no memory of where he's been the past night. Someone turns up dead. He's not actually sure if he's the killer, and that intrigued me, uh, but then right after that, he gets murdered, so I'm like, well, I don't know what any of the point of that ended up being. Now, Sherlock Holmes's arch enemy pops up in this one and turns out to be behind it all. That, that's revealed very early on. Uh, Moriarty, Professor Moriarty, shows up in a bunch of these movies, and always played by a different actor, and this is definitely my least favorite. Henry Daniel plays Moriarty in this one. And fun fact, he actually has appeared in several of these Sherlock Holmes films before this, not playing Moriarty, pretty much always playing a very weak and kind of pathetic character. So just going from him playing those kind of roles to play Moriarty in the same series did not work for me. And he's by far the most boring, boring Moriarty. And I'm not actually a huge fan of Professor Moriarty in these movies. Uh, it seems like every time he shows up the mystery kind of deflates in there because I like guessing who the killer is trying to figure out from a collection of suspects but if it's Moriarty it's Moriarty I think there's only one Moriarty film on this list that makes it work and we're gonna get to it much later but overall it is low energy uh the way Moriarty gets caught is super anticlimactic the ending is very abrupt that that's kind of a trend with the lesser movies in this series but I will shout out Hilary Brooke who plays the titular woman in green she actually showed up in a few of these movies as different characters but here 
She makes a big impression. I think she's the most memorable thing about the movie. At number 11, we've got the second World War II propaganda movie. They made three before Universal started moving away from that. This is Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon. In the midst of World War II, Sherlock Holmes rescues the Swiss inventor of a new bomb site from the Gestapo and brings him to England, where he shortly falls into the clutches of Professor Moriarty. This one is credited as an adaption of the Doyle story, The Adventures of the Dancing Men, but utilizes very little of that story. That's a running theme with these movies as well. So I don't like these World War II propaganda Sherlock Holmes movies, but this one ranks over a couple of films that aren't like that because Professor Moriarty in this is played by Lionel Atwell. I love Lionel Atwell from a lot of different like Universal Monsters movies and, and other movies like uh, Mystery of the Wax Museum and Dr. X. He shows up in horror films a lot. He's a very good, very memorable Moriarty, and he's by far the saving grace of this movie that's otherwise kind of dull. The film doesn't really have a mystery. The story's not interesting, but I will shout out that Holmes does have a struggle in this. He's trying to decipher a code uh, that's, you know, being used for war stuff. And it's a bigger challenge and he struggles through it more than he has in a lot of these movies. So I do respect that. I like to see Sherlock Holmes challenged. And this film also, I, I wrote this down in my notes, uh, it has a, a secret bookshelf door and I don't know, I just kind of love that kind of thing. That's the kind of, I was struggling to make notes for this movie. It's it's not very interesting. Let's move on. Cracking into the top 10, we've got the final film in the series, Brian De Palma's Dress to Kill from 1980. Oh, hang on. Wrong movie. Sorry. Dress to Kill, the... Sherlock Holmes movie, but it is called Dress to Kill. A convicted thief in Dartmoor prison hides the location of the stolen Bank of England printing plates inside three music boxes. When the innocent purchasers of the boxes start to be murdered or attacked, Holman Watson investigate. Now this one also has an original story, but it does utilize elements from the adventure of the six Napoleons, which another film in the series actually does much closer, and a scandal in Bohemia. Now I got kind of excited at the beginning of this one because Irene Adler gets mentioned right at the start. Irene Adler is probably the most notable female character from the original Conan Doyle stories. You'll see her also in the Benedict Cumberbatch series and in the Robert Downey Jr. movies. And at right then there is a mysterious woman who ends up being kind of the antagonist antagonist, the uh, ying to Sherlock Holmes's yang in this. And I thought for sure she was going to be Irene Adler and I got excited. She's not. Very weird. I don't know why they bring up Irene Adler. She never shows up in this. The, the woman is... It's very weird, but anyway. I will say this female lead is played by Patricia Morrison, and she is, I think, the best female lead in the entire series. She's so good, so charismatic, very convincing as this brilliant foil for Sherlock Holmes. Uh, I, I kind of just wish she was that iconic character, I'm not sure why, but she is awesome in this movie. Uh, the best thing about the film, because this is the last film in the series. By this point, I could tell Basil Rathbone was losing interest, and he does feel a little disengaged in this one. And this one does feel slow, uh, which is surprising because pretty much none of these movies feel slow. They're very short. They move very fast. And this one is kind of lacking energy for me. I still like it. I like the mystery around these music boxes, even though several elements from it are very reminiscent of some other films in the series. You could tell they were recycling elements. And then there are aspects to Holmes's deduction in this movie that feel more like magic than uh, intelligence. Like it gets super convenient in this movie. Like not, I, not just Basil Rathbone was losing interest. He felt like the writers were as well. Now I liked the movie. I thought it was fun, pleasant, but a little bit slow. And it didn't, oh, the script was not always great. At number nine is the last of the World War II propaganda movies and definitely the best of the bunch. This is Sherlock Holmes in Washington. In World War II, a British secret agent carrying a vitally important document is kidnapped en route to Washington. The British government calls on Sherlock Holmes to recover it. Now, this one is actually the first in the series to be completely original and have no elements from any of the original stories. Unlike the last two World War II ones, this one actually has a mystery to it, which I really appreciated when I got to this movie. I did really like the mystery around this missing document, trying to find out where it is, how it's being transported. And when they figure out what kind of very inconspicuous way the document is being moved around, uh, it starts to become clear to the viewer that it's getting passed from person to person without even realizing 
filming it. And as the camera is just moving, following it from person to person in this party scene is really fun. It's a really fun sequence. Now, the villain in this movie is played by George Zuko. And George Zuko was actually the first, and I think the best, person to play Moriarty in the series a few films back. And uh, and I thought for sure that like Moriarty had returned. But no, he's he's playing a different character. There are actually several, <laughs> several actors that appear several times in these movies, uh, but playing different characters. And yes, George Zuko was one of them. But even so, he's still a darn good villain. I, I really like George Zuko, seeing him pop up in anything. These movies also have a running gag of Sherlock Holmes dressing up in different disguises. And I love that because you really get to see Basil Rathbone's range as an actor. In this time period in Hollywood, actors didn't get to do a lot of crazy different stuff. You know, they generally stuck to their persona. Uh, but in the disguises, you get to see Basil Rathbone do a lot of funny things. And in this movie, he plays a very weird, quirky antique collector in this one scene. Very funny. He's so good. He's just the best Sherlock Holmes. I love him. Okay, coming up to number eight, we're actually out of the movies that I have mixed feelings about. Now, the films from this point on are not perfect, but I overall really like and recommend them. At number eight, we've got Pursuit to Algiers. After the King of Ruthania has been assassinated, Holmes and Watson are engaged to escort his son to Algiers aboard a transatlantic ocean liner, which also carries a number of suspicious persons, any one of whom may be involved in a plot to assassinate him. This one starts out with Holmes and Watson about to go on vacation, which is fun to see. They're just having a grand old time at the beginning of this movie. But they get wrapped up into this assassination attempt, and I almost thought the movie was going to be a little too much about political intrigue when I like to see traditional murder mysteries. And I guess that's technically true, but it ended up being super fun. Now, for a little while in the movie, Watson's the only one who's actually on this boat that serves as the location of pretty much the entire film. And Watson almost feels like the real star of this movie. And I loved it. This film overall has a much lighter, more funny, just very fun tone to it than most of the movies. And I think that's because Watson gets a little bit more of the spotlight. Nigel Bruce is delightful, funny, incredibly charming in this movie. I just love to watch him. Eventually, Sherlock Holmes does show up and he's great. The bad guys in this movie actually respect Sherlock Holmes and don't want to kill him. They only have to oppose Holmes because Holmes is trying to protect this prince, now king of this country. The bad guys know what Sherlock Holmes is doing. He knows what they're doing. And it's just fun watching them interact on this boat, keeping things very polite and British, um, while also knowing what everybody's up to. Like there's a scene where one of them tries to assassinate Sherlock Holmes while he's in his bedroom. And Holmes is just banter to him to just make him feel stupid for failing is really, really entertaining. Now, our beautiful female lead in this one that we have in pretty much all these movies is Marjorie Riordan. And very good, very charming, and actually has a more interesting little subplot uh, than a lot of the female leads do in these movies, which I appreciate it. But it doesn't totally get wrapped up. The ending to this movie is very abrupt. And while the main plot's wrapped up, not everything is. And I just would have loved like five more minutes at the end of the movie. But overall, I really enjoy it. It's fun. It's funny. And Nigel Bruce sings in this one. It's a great Watson movie, I would have to say. My number seven is the film that came just after the World War II films. And it's the return to a very traditional murder mystery, which I really enjoyed. This is Sherlock Holmes faces death. Several murders occur at a convalescent home where Dr. Watson has volunteered his services. He summons Holmes for help and the master detective proceeds to solve the crime from a long list of suspects, including the owners of the home, the staff, and the patients recovering there. This is a loose adaption of the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Musgrave Ritual. Now, this film is just all about the vibes. I was just so happy to watch this after the World War II movies. This this is where they figured out how to technically make them take place in the 1940s, but not always totally feel like it. Those World War II films feel much more modern, you know, for the 40s. Uh, but this one, it might as well be period piece because it takes place in a very spooky, kind of gothic mansion. Everything around them is antique, and you can barely tell that this doesn't take place in Victorian times. And a lot of the movies from this point forward pull that off pretty well, which I super appreciate because I thought this was uh, going to be very modern, topical, 1940s kind of a thing for a while. But that was really just those World War II movies. So this one really brings us back to basics. A lot of these films also, especially in this middle section of the series where we're at right now, are very spooky. Like they're not horror films, but they've got very uh, dark and gloomy, dark and stormy night kind of atmosphere to them. And I love that. Now, the movie itself, 
Very typical murder mystery. Nothing going on here that's going to blow your mind. Nothing that's going to subvert any formulas. But I was just really happy to watch a very traditional murder mystery in a dark and spooky castle on a dark and spooky night. Also, when Universal took over these movies, uh, for a while they all ended with Sherlock Holmes giving some kind of a morality speech at the end. And sometimes it's awkward, but this is the best one. So, you know, take that as you will. At number six is a film with a great title. This is The Pearl of Death. The famous Borgia Pearl, a valuable gem with a history of bringing murder and misfortune to its owner, is brought to London thanks in part to Sherlock Holmes. But before long, the jewel is stolen due to an error on Holmes' part, and shortly thereafter, a series of horrible murders begin, the murderer leaving his victims with their spine snapped and surrounded by a mass of smashed China. Now, this is the film that's also based on the Doyle story, The Adventure of the Six Napoleons. Now, this film has a lot of elements I like. First of all, it's got Evelyn Anchors, again from The Wolfman, uh, but this time not doing a bad British accent, so great to see her. And it's got a criminal character called the Hoxton Creeper, who is this giant monster man that snaps people's spines when he kills them, which is awesome. It kind of takes this movie into like a Dick Tracy comic booky kind of a level. Which is really, really fun. But the Creeper isn't working alone. The brains behind this whole operation is a very Moriarty-like character, although not technically Moriarty. Uh, but the actor, I don't think, totally sells it because Holmes is really trying to sell him as this brilliant, genius criminal. And uh, I think he pulls it off okay. But the mystery around why people are dying, how it connects to the Pearl, what's with all the smashed China around the dead bodies is actually very intriguing and I think leads to a really cool reveal. Now I'm super excited to get into what is clearly the top five of this series. This is the cream of the crop for these movies. So at number five, we have got The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Having once again avoided criminal conviction, Professor Moriarty develops a murderous plan to finish off his last major nemesis, Sherlock Holmes, by making him fail to prevent the perfect crime. Does it involve a family curse, the crown jewels of England, or something else. Now this one claims to be an adaption of the 1899 play titled Sherlock Holmes, but apparently it bears very little resemblance to that. At least that's what I've heard. I haven't seen the play. Okay, so this is the second film in the whole series, which means it's the last one that Fox made. And the first two that Fox made are 90 minute movies while the rest of them are around an hour long and are taking place in Victorian times. So I really like the period recreation of this film. I love to see Sherlock Holmes in the 1800s like he originally was. It's just great to see. He's got the traditional, you know, cap with the, I don't even know what that's called. But with the two bills on the front and back, um, it's just the most iconic possible look for Sherlock Holmes. He's got the pipe, although he's he's got it in the, the whole series. At least he keeps the pipe. It's just a great look. Phenomenal look. Now, as supporting actors, you got George Zuko as Moriarty. Best Moriarty. This is the best Moriarty movie. Why? Well, it's not just because of George Zuko. It's also because this movie finds a way to make Moriarty the villain while still having a really intriguing mystery. Because you've really got two mysteries going on at the same time, one involving Moriarty, one you don't even know what's going on, and the way it all comes together is actually really cool and really interesting. Um, none of the other Moriarty films pull this off. Uh, the rest of them, you know, it, it doesn't even feel like a mystery because he's just the bad guy. This is the one where it works. But then you've also got a very young Ida Lupino in this as the female lead. I love Ida Lupino. So it's really, really cool to see her in this. She's great, of course. She's great in everything. Just so gorgeous. This is just a really satisfying Sherlock movie. You get to see him do a lot of investigating. You get to see him have an action scene towards the end, a fight scene, which is pretty cool. And Basil Rathbone just rocks it. So as you can tell, this is not quite my preferred film of the two Fox Victorian set Sherlock movies but it's still really good. At number four is one of the most horror of all the Sherlock Holmes movies. This is The Scarlet Claw. When a woman is found dead with her throat torn out, the local villagers blame the legendary monster of La Morte Rouge, which roams the marshes around the village. But Sherlock Holmes, who gets drawn into the case from nearby Quebec, suspects a human murderer. This one is not an adaption of any of the original Doyle stories, but this one feels like the 
Universal Monsters Sherlock movie. Now, uh, technically, 12 of these movies are made by Universal, and some of them have some good spooky vibes to them, but this is the one that feels exactly like a Universal Monsters movie, but just happens to have Sherlock Holmes, which is awesome, because I'm a huge fan of the Universal Monsters. It's just great to watch a Sherlock movie that is technically not in that canon, but fits in perfectly. This is a monster movie, at least so you think, for quite a while. And all you've got all these villagers in this small little rural town talking about the monster that roams the marshes. And it's such a great, great spooky classic vibe. Uh, but Sherlock Holmes is convinced that there's not a monster, there's a real murder. And you know, Sherlock Holmes is, he's always right. But you do get to see something like a glowing ghost sort of a thing. And it's a very cool image. And the movie uh, has a look that looks a lot like the Wolfman when it comes to out in the marshes. It actually utilizes the Wolfman score, so you will hear music exactly from the Wolfman. And the whole vibe of this thing is so up my personal alley. I really liked it. And I really did like the reveal to the mystery at the end. It did keep me guessing. But like I said, these films usually end with Sherlock Holmes giving some kind of morality speech. And this one is like some kind of weird patriotic ode to Canada because it takes place in Canada. I don't know. It's a little funny to me, but you know, that's cool. At number three is a movie that is just so much fun. When I finished this movie, more than any of the others, I just thought to myself, that is a fun movie. And this is The Spider Woman. Sherlock Holmes investigates a series of so-called pajama suicides in which men are leaving their beds at night and killing themselves. He learns that the female villain behind them is as cunning as Moriarty and as venomous as a spider. This film incorporates elements from the 1890 novel The Sign of the Four, as well as the short stories The Final Problem, The Adventure of the the Empty House, The Adventure of the Devil's Foot, and The Adventure of the Speckled Band. So this one opens in kind of an interesting way where Sherlock Holmes uh, tells Watson about how he's getting sick lately, and then he falls into a river and dies. And that's an attention-grabbing way to open up your Sherlock Holmes movie. I'm like, what is going on? But it turns out Sherlock Holmes has faked his death because he's very intrigued by these pajama suicides that are going on. He's convinced it's the work of a killer, and he wanted to take himself out of the equation so the killer would be less careful because she would know that Sherlock Holmes is not on the case. Not very necessary, but a very attention-grabbing way to start things off. I mean, I was certainly intrigued. The titular Spider Woman, our lead villain in this, is played by Gail Sondergaard, and I thought she was great in this. Very, a really good villain, and I really liked all her scenes with Sherlock. They had kind of a good banter, a little bit of sexual chemistry going on there that was very fun to see. And uh, Sherlock Holmes has a really great in going in disguise storyline where he's playing a man from India. He kind of like fakes this romance with her, but she really knows what's going on. And those scenes are just really, really entertaining to see them banter off of each other and have like this battle of wits. The whole plot going on here ends up being really ludicrous, campy and ridiculous involving spiders and circus performers and a carnival. The movie actually uh, closes out at a carnival, which I love because I always love carnival atmosphere for movies. So that made me really happy. And Sherlock Holmes really does come very close to dying in this movie. And like I said, I always like to see Sherlock Holmes get challenged. He does get so in this film. This one is a blast. It's just light and breezy and super, super fun. And that's why it makes it so high at number three. At number two is the film that it seems like most people seem to think is the best of the series. And I can't argue with that. I mean, I've got it at my two. This is The House of Fear. The good comrades are a collection of gentlemen who live together in the remote Scottish castle of Drearcliff House, the ancestral home of their eldest member. All there seems serene until one by one the members receive an envelope full of orange pips and begin to perish in the most grisly of manners. Foul play is suspected by the good comrade's insurance agent who turns to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson for help. This is loosely based on the Holmes short story, The Adventure of the Orange Pips. While I've been praising some movies on this list for having a very fun and lighthearted feel to them, this is probably the best of the movies that feels very dark and morbid. And I really, really like that. This has phenomenal dark, spooky, 
dark stormy night atmosphere to it. In fact, uh, to as an aside, I've gotten some requests on this channel to do a list of my favorite movies with dark and stormy night atmosphere. Haven't done that yet, but this film is would make that list because it's just so, so good. The story is super intriguing. Like I really did not know where this mystery was going. And a lot of times in these movies, I'm just kind of enjoying their fun and their feel to them. And I'm not like really drawn into the mystery, but this one, I felt it. And I noticed like this feels noticeably different than watching a lot of other of these movies. Like I'm really drawn into this story. It's very, very intriguing. Uh, it's got a great supporting cast, uh, making up these good comrades who are dying one by one. And they're very particular characters that really stand out, which I like. Uh, Sherlock, Baz Basil Rathbone is in top form in a darker way. And the revealed in the mystery, I definitely didn't see coming. So this one, I, I just really recommend as an intriguing mystery with fantastic, spooky, dark and stormy night in in a giant gothic mansion atmosphere. I'm a big fan. But at number one is the one that started it all. I do think it's the best. That is the Hound of the Baskervilles. On his uncle's death, Sir Henry Baskerville returns from Canada to take charge of his ancestral hall on the desolate moors of Devonshire and finds that Sherlock Holmes is there to investigate the local belief that his uncle was killed by a monster hound that has roamed the moors since 1650 and is likely to strike again at Sir Henry. Yes, this is the first film in the series, one produced by Fox, which is period piece with incredible period piece atmosphere to it. Basil Rathbone is in top form in the traditional Sherlock Holmes look. He looks phenomenal in this movie. Murder, my dear Watson. Refined, cold-blooded murder. Murder? I've been talking a lot about atmosphere and vibes with these movies. This one, it's the best. Just absolutely stellar. We're out in the English countryside. We're on the moors. It's all foggy, super spooky. You've got a monster hound. It's a classic horror story in addition to being a classic Sherlock Holmes story, which I think is why it appeals to me so much. I am also a fan of the Hammer version of the story, which is, uh, sorry, Peter Cushing as Sherlock Holmes. Also good, but I think this one I like even better. And I do think it's because of Basil Rathbone. He's the best Sherlock Holmes. Well, I said the Scarlet Claw is the Universal Monsters Sherlock film of the series. And I think that's true. This one really does feel like it as well, even though it's not a Universal film. I mean, it's even got John Carradine in supporting cast. You've also got Richard Green as Sir Henry Baskerville, who played Robin Hood in the Hammer Robin Hood films. That's very cool. Oh man, there's also a seance in this movie. So uh, the, the spooky vibes are just stellar, out of control good. And because this is the first in the series, I wasn't used to the fact that Basil Rath Sherlock Holmes was going to do a lot of disguises. And he has a disguise in this movie that fooled me. I didn't know it was Basil Rathbone until it got revealed. And it did have a satisfying end to the mystery. Now it definitely deviates from the novel and the Hammer film. Like it does make the romance a lot simpler and easier. Uh, there's a lot of romances in these movies, the young lovers plots, but I didn't mind. I think this movie is incredibly fun. Very well done. It's my favorite of the series. So that's my ranking folks of all the Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes films. Let me know what you think about these movies down in the comments below, or let me know if you're interested in checking these out for the first time. I really enjoyed doing this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it. And if you did, check out my channel. I've got a lot of other videos, a lot of spooky horror ranking videos on the channel as well. Like I just did one of my top 15 Dracula movies. Give a like if you enjoy this and a subscribe for more videos like this. Thank you so much for watching. With all that said, don't forget the game is afoot and I'll see you next time.